One of the curious things about our personal outlook on life is that we tend to live in terms of what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that is that if you think life is horrible, then you will see a lot of horrible things, more so than probably others. And if you think life is a blessing, then you will probably see the blessings. Uh, If you'll turn with me to begin with in Titus 1. We have many examples, not only of this in the world around us, but even God makes this statement, draws this to our attention. In Titus 1, and in verse 15, Paul writing to the young pastor Titus here, he says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. And so I'm sure you know of people like that. Perhaps somebody that just is never happy, no matter what the circumstances are. Maybe you're blessed with being around someone that's the opposite. They are never in a bad mood. No matter what God or the world throws at them, they are doing fine. We have a curious example for us along this line in 1 Samuel 17. This is the story, you might remember, of David and Goliath. And it's interesting in even looking at the family dynamics and how things are playing out. Um, David, at this time, is left behind in the family to tend his father's sheep. His brothers had gone off to be part of Saul's army that was going to fight the Philistines. Oftentimes in these ancient conflicts, you would have what would be called a champion, the best warrior of each side. Instead of the whole army fighting each other, Um, one would go out, and this one, whoever won, whoever conquered the other, would determine the outcome of the conflict. And so they were at a stalemate here. The Philistines on one side of the valley, it's an interesting valley if you look at it geographically, but on one side were the Philistines, on the other side were the armies of Israel, and they would taunt each other back and forth, throwing insults. In this case, Goliath, it was pretty much one-sided. So, in the course of time, David was sent by his father to take supplies to his brother. We're used to a modern military supplying most of these things. Anciently, you would take a lot of your own material and food and such with you. And so the father is sending supplies to his sons that are fighting with Saul's army. But as David approaches the army, his brothers see him, and they're not happy. I don't know why. They didn't think much of David, it seems. But upon seeing David, they thought he had abandoned what his father needed him for, that he had left the sheep unattended to come see what the action was all about. But as David approached, he wasn't concerned about what his brothers thought. Rather, he was hearing all of these taunts and all of these disrespectful things that Goliath was saying about the God of Israel. And he was motivated to do something about it. As the account goes, then David convinced Saul to let him represent the army. There are a lot of interesting things here in this story. David was not unknown to Saul, but David was not known as a military man. In fact, the accounts vary. David was probably in his late teens, so he wasn't battle-hardened. This was not a career he had chosen, and that he was able to convince Saul to let him be the champion. He probably stood out because he had courage, as we'll see here in a moment, where everybody else was waiting for someone else to step forward and take care of this Philistine. And so the story goes that David was going to try on Saul's armor. Saul wanted him to go into battle as Saul saw he needed to be, but he wasn't equipped for this. Goliath was a pretty impressive individual physically, depending on how you count the cubits, Goliath could have been anywhere from about 9 foot 6 inches tall to about 11 feet 10 inches tall. Either one of those is huge. And then also it's been estimated that Goliath at those heights probably would have been around 700 pounds. Most of it muscle. (laughs) He was a pretty uh, formidable individual. The armor alone that he wore, based on his size and the metal it would have taken, probably weighed around 175 pounds. So he's carrying 175 pounds on his body. The spear tip alone talks about it uh, 
the length of it being like a weaver's beam. The, the spear tip was probably about 15 pounds. You can see why no one wanted to approach this man. No one was eager to square off against him, but David, as I mentioned, was fitted with Saul's armor um, because David was a little familiar with this. In the previous chapter, he was mentioned as at times being Saul's armor bearer. That is, he would help Saul with this before battle and in some cases carry his shield into battle. But David rejected that armor because it was too heavy and unfamiliar to him. It also probably didn't fit him. He was probably a different size being younger than Saul. And so if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, we'll, we'll read something here. And then we're going to go back and flesh some of this out. But in 1 Samuel 17, David gathers up just five stones. He said, I'm not familiar with the armor. I'm not familiar. I don't need a shield. The sword is unwieldy. I'm not used to all those things. He essentially said, I'm going to use my sling. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 40 says, He took off his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. He put them in his shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had. His sling was in his hand. He drew near to the Philistine. Now this, again, has interesting elements in it. Why five? Some commentaries will talk about that this was so that if David missed with one or glanced with another, that he would have essentially enough ammunition to finish the job. But David was skilled with this. We don't think in the modern sense of a sling being a military weapon. But in the hands of someone who has developed this skill, it is literally deadly, as we see here in this account. I don't believe David was fearful and doubtful of his skills in this regard, if you will, because later on it says that David ran to meet Goliath. He was not hesitant in this. Um, the slaying as a military weapon was used in almost every ancient army, just like they had archer troops and they had chariot troops, they had sling troops. And this slaying, um, again, could be thrown not only with great accuracy, but great speed. It's been estimated that um, it was at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour that these stones could travel. Now, if you imagine a stone, David picked up random stones, but he probably had the familiarity of what stones would work best. But think a stone around the size of a ping pong ball. This could fly a fairly flat trajectory, and it was known to penetrate armor. This is how powerful this could be. Don't think of a sling this way. Think of it from the side like this. And then when one end was released, the stone would fly towards the target. So if we move down to verse 45 here in 1 Samuel 17, it says, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Eternal of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Eternal will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And this is very telling, because where is David's confidence? It was in God delivering in the situation. Verse 48, and so it was when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Now, I've used this account in another, story, in another sermon in another way, but David had the advantage here. It doesn't seem like it. I mean, remember, Goliath is carrying about 175 pounds of armor. He is not going to move quick, even at his size. He's weighed down with this. He's using uh, close quarter weapons, spear and a javelin. David didn't have to get close, close quarter to him with a, with a stone. And so David is confident in his skill in knowing that God would deliver this Philistine. So in verse 15, David prevailed, excuse me, 50, verse 50, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, struck the Philistine, and killed him. Some misread this and say the stone only stunned Goliath, and David finished him off with a sword. That's not what it says here. It said it struck him and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So why did David need the sword? We read back up earlier, David said, I'm going to take your head. 
He wanted to make sure it was finished completely. And so then there, there it says, verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of, that is, Goliath's sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed him, cutting off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So David, in this one blow, routed the armies of the Philistines. But what about the other four stones? With the Philistine army fleeing, David couldn't finish the job. He picked up five stones for a reason. Not because he wasn't skilled. Goliath had four brothers. Depending on the interpretation of the Hebrew word, they could be cousins, relatives. Nonetheless, there were a total of these five giants. David was going to go after all of them, not just Goliath. You don't need to turn there, but in 2 Samuel 21, verse 15, we find the Philistines, because they had escaped, they were at war with Israel again. But David was asked in that account by his warriors, by his troops, not to be in the thick of that battle. So in 2 Samuel 21, verse 16, we read of uh, Ishbi Banab, first of these other giants that are killed. In verse 18 of that chapter, Saph is killed. Verses 19 and 20, the other two are killed. Others finished the job that David started. David originally went out with five stones because he had in his mind to defend God and kill all five, all at the same time if necessary, one stone for each. He was confident that God would deliver not only Goliath, but these other four giants as well. This is all very interesting to consider. It might just be history for some people, but let's look at this a little more metaphorically. What giants are you going to face in the coming year? What giants did we think we would face this past year? <laughs> I don't think anybody saw any of that coming. Will we be successful in slaying them with God's help? Do we have the faith and confidence in God to know that we can slay these enemies, these giants that will oppose us? Will we help one another to slay the giants? You can read the account of the men that helped Jonathan and Jerry, Orgum, Abishai, and so forth, the others that helped to slay these other giants. In all fairness, I don't think any of us has faced someone that would be as imposing as Goliath would be physically. But we face other giants, don't we? Trials in life, losing a job, overcoming character issues that we haven't been aware of probably for decades, if ever, in our lives. Facing giants of those in opposition to the life we want to live of God's way. The list could go on and on. What do we do when we're faced with these forms of trials? Well, if you're still here in 1 Samuel 17, let's go back up to verse 32. It says, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him because of, fail because of him, meaning Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David's attitude here towards this trial was that it wasn't really a trial. It was God's to deliver. David was simply the agent that would help see it through. But he said, let no man's heart fail. We face our trials. We must do with courage not fearing the outcome doesn't mean we know the outcome but that we can face it knowing that it doesn't matter what the outcome is we know god's deliverance is there In verse 33 david said to saul i'm sorry we read that i'm sorry my thumb's in the wrong place verse 33 saul said to david you're not able to go against this philistine to fight him for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth you don't have the same experience but david said to saul your servant I have my own experience, used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, this lion or this bear, he said, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. I don't care what age you are, that's impressive. <laughs> to go after a bear or a lion, this is the, the attitude, if you will, the confidence that David had. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Notice verse 37 then. Moreover, he said, the eternal who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Even in those situations, David knew where his deliverance came from. He didn't say, I did it. I learned how to accomplish this. God delivered me. He says, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
And so Saul said to David, go and the eternal be with you. David, as I said, ultimately knew it was God who would deliver him. Saul was trying to supply David with what he thought he needed, what Saul thought was needed. This was the way it was done, right? David wasn't thinking in that regard because he was allowing God to be the one to decide how it would be delivered. And so in verse 39, it said, he fastened the sword and the armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. He hadn't trained with this equipment. But he said, and he, David, though, said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I have not tested them, so he took them off. David needed something that was familiar with, that he was familiar with, not something given to him at the last minute. The sling he had was tried and tested. He knew how to use that and knew it would be sufficient. And so then verse 40, again, we read earlier, he picks up these five stones. Today I'm going to use these five stones in a metaphorical sense, as I said, to see what they can mean for us in helping us to face our own giants, the trials we face in our lives. And the first of these stones then could represent prayer. Prayer is our first stone. Prayer is very important in facing any trial because it's the opportunity to take our problems to God and ask him for his help. As we heard in the sermonette, to go to a friend that we know has our best interests at heart, to have that conversation. We can see that in the actions of those like King Hezekiah. I've, I've always had that stuck in my mind, when, especially facing really tough situations. Hezekiah, if you remember the count, is surrounded by the armies of Sennacherib, and he doesn't know what to do. He receives this letter of surrender. These are the terms. Come peaceably and we'll spare your life. He takes the letter before God in the temple. Did God not know what was in the letter? It's Hezekiah essentially saying, here it is. I don't know what to do with this. I always, that's 2 Kings 19. I always find that very impressive because he took his problem to God. God responded in a way that probably surprised everybody. Nobody saw that coming. But prayer is a way of communicating our problems to God. It shows that we recognize first that we have a problem that we cannot handle on our own. I think, personally, that too many times we exacerbate a problem because we're trying to fix it instead of allowing God to fix it. But what do we do when we are faced with these trials, these giants in these trials? Um, if you're still in 1 Samuel 17 with me, again, verse 32 that we read earlier, David said, let no man's heart fail because of him. It's a mindset that we need to see as we face our trials, to be confident in these things. The second stone, then, is fasting. Fasting. This stone offers another way to demonstrate to God our humility and to show him that we need him in our lives because without the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and food that God supplies, we're nothing, are we? We need those things to exist. And at times there are problems that take more than prayer to overcome. Let's look at that in Matthew 17. Christ, as he trained his disciples, I'm sure was abundantly aware of the fact that these men were still carnal. But they were with Christ all the time, and they were beginning to see things, even without God's Spirit in them at this point, that they could, they, they could do, if you will, through the power of God that he was providing. And Christ sent them out for additional training to go out and practice some of the things that he had been teaching them. And in the course of time, they came upon a situation where there was a man possessed by a demon they could not cast out. So that's the background here. Matthew 17, verse 19. The disciples then came to Jesus privately and saying, why could we not cast it out? Now, he had. They're asking why. It's a great question. What do we need to do differently? What do we need to do better? He says to them, verse 20, because of your unbelief, I don't read that as a condemnation. He simply is telling them they don't have the right tools at this point. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will, and nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21, however, this kind, this type of demon, 
does not come out except by prayer and fasting, meaning you have to be even closer to God, he's telling them here. But again, going back to sermons I've given here of recent, whose faith is this? It's not our faith. How do we have this faith on our own? We, we can't. Likewise, there are occasions when we'll face trials that require a time of fasting. It's a tool that God gives us so we can draw closer to Him. It reflects an attitude that acknowledges our need for God to provide the basic necessities of life physically, but also that we need Him in us spiritually to be able to address these things, to live the way He wants us to live. As we afflict ourselves through fasting, we show that we rely on God for all of our needs. There is no pretense. Some trials are just that big. But by nature, we're egocentric, aren't we? We're self-centered. We must work at becoming God-centered, and that's where fasting comes in. Because the fasting helps us to learn humility. To better understand how great God is and how weak we are. There are days that you can probably go without food because you're not thinking about it. You're in the middle of a, an important task. You're on point. You know that there's a deadline, and you're working, working, working. At the end of the day, you realize, I didn't have lunch. Maybe you even missed dinner. You didn't even think about it. But then there are times you think, I need to fast. And as soon as you think that, you get hungry, don't you? David understood this aspect of fasting. Let's look. Go back with me to Matthew 5. This is the perspective that we need to have in terms of fasting especially, but in our relationship with God in general as well. Matthew 5 and verse 6, in the middle of the Beatitudes here, Christ says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He doesn't have to tell us to hunger and thirst for food and water. That's natural, isn't it? But to have this focus, notice, for they shall be filled, meaning filled with God's Spirit. David, back in Psalm 35 and verse 13, talked about humbling himself with fasting. We understand that because we become weak physically, don't we? In addition to reinforcing the fact that God is the one who sustains us and supplies all of our needs, an important lesson also is that as we become weaker physically, when we have the right frame of mind from fasting, then we become stronger in God spiritually. The third stone, then, is Bible study. We pray to be close to God. We humble ourselves to remove more of ourselves in the relationship. The third stone is Bible study, then, because in principle, if not in reality, a lot of situations we face in life have already been faced by someone else. The players can change, obviously, the time frame, the context, but there's nothing new under the sun, really. The Bible tells us that Christ was tempted in all points yet without sin. Does that mean that he faced every possible sin? No, I read that in that he faced what we call human nature. He understands the pull of the flesh, the things that we face, and yet he conquered those temptations through God. When we face trials, we can come up with all kinds of ways to solve our problems, but our solution should be acceptable to both God and man. Oftentimes, if we leave God out of the equation, we just make it worse. This is where studying the Word of God comes into play. Because not only can we see what others have faced, we can see the mindset of what became important and how they trusted in God and how God delivered them. And we can have the confidence that God will deliver us as well. Studying the Word of God is not always just a quick answer. Let's look at that in Isaiah 28. This is why we have to immerse ourselves in God's Word, because we see different things connect over the course of studying. We can even see this over the course of our lives. You know, I, there are some verses I read now that I, I know I didn't understand when I was younger. Or I'll hear a verse used in a message someone else give, and I'll see connections I haven't seen before. In Isaiah 28, verse 9, the context here is a different 
uh, situation, if you will, but this principle transcends this particular situation. Isaiah 28, verse 9 says, Whom will he teach knowledge? Whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from the milk, those just drawn from the breast. Now he's speaking spiritually here, isn't he? This is why Paul told um, Timothy not to lay hands quickly on someone young in the faith. It takes time, doesn't it, to learn and put things together. Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that we add pieces over time. That only comes with consistent study. When we do that prayerfully, and even at times while fasting, it becomes very powerful. Um, well, let's just go ahead and read those. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Second Timothy 2 and verse 15, Paul again, talking to Timothy here, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To be diligent in studying God's word. We don't have to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar. We don't have to be the most impressive historian. We don't have to have the skills the world looks at. We're not studying these things to become those things. We're studying them to draw closer to God. Depending on your Bible across the page, in chapter 3, verse 14, he again says, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. I studied German two years in college. I had always wanted to study German. I learned enough to more or less function. <laughs> you know, I could order a beer. I could ask where the toilet was. I could get directions, some of those basic things. I couldn't do any of that now because I haven't used it in years. It's all gone. I know a few words still, but spiritually, this is especially the same. He tells Timothy here, continue in those things. The old adage we have, use it or lose it, is what we're talking about here. Verse 15, that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We might even read a passage that has nothing to do with what we're facing, the giant that stands before us. But we see something in that lesson, nonetheless, that helps us, that God will direct us to, to use or to have of benefit. Notice it's also profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, to be complete. It's not just an exercise, if you will. It's not just to impress others. It's so that we learn more of the mind of God. So then the fourth stone that follows is that of meditation. This is not the type of meditation where one sits on the floor with their legs crossed and hums. The emptying of a mind is a very dangerous thing to do, actually. Rather, this is speaking to going over a thought again and again, much like a ruminant animal like a sheep, you know, they'll eat, and then they'll pull that back up and they'll chew it again and again and again to get it digested in the right way, that you just go over and over and over these things. And this is where quality trumps quantity, that you read a passage and then ponder it. What does God want us to see in this? When we pray to God, what is it that we can hear him bringing back to us, if you will? When we fast, what is it that we see, especially in God's Word, that will more thoroughly equip us, as Paul says here in this verse? This is the way we need to approach everything, to ponder. How many times did God say to various ones, stand still? That might be an interesting sermon sometime to give. And it's not this disengaging. It's a matter of being patient. While we wait on God, knows Colossians 3 and verse 1. 
We're talking about a different focus, aren't we, from what the world normally has, the world around us, or even what we carnally would focus on. Colossians 3 and verse 1 says, Then if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are from above. We seek them by meditation, which is an application of the prayer and the fasting and the Bible study. Again, chewing on those things mentally to see what it is that is from above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. They're temporary, aren't they? Even our trials are temporary. Even if the trial takes 20 years, it's still temporary, isn't it? Set your mind on the things above, meaning from God, what he will bring. This helps us many times in these trials, don't we? We have a perspective because we know what's on the other side of the trial. For, he, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ. This life even isn't really our own anymore. We submitted that to God because he paid for it through the sacrifice of his son. Psalm 119 up there on the screen, verse 15, David talks about, I will meditate on your ways. This was easy to do at times with his job when he was younger as a sheep herder because there was work to be done, obviously. Anytime you would move the sheep to a new field, one of the responsibilities was to make sure the water was clean, it wasn't foul, that it wasn't going to make the animals sick. You'd make sure there weren't noxious weeds around they would get into, that it was open enough you could keep an eye out for predators. You would get them settled at night. You would check them out to make sure they hadn't hurt themselves during the day, that they could be attended to, all of these things. But once they were down for the night, there wasn't a whole lot you needed to do. So he had time to think about the ways of God. And so even there in Psalm 119, verse 97, David says, your law is my meditation. Is this what we frame our life on? It's something that should guide us. And God's spirit then will lead us to deeper understanding of these things. When facing a trial, we need a sound mind to make wise decisions. That doesn't come from human nature. It comes from God. To not decide things in a rush. But after careful thought and consideration, going over it again and again until we have the confidence in the solution that God is showing us. And so finally, the fifth stone. Fifth stone to consider here is service. That might seem a bit out of place here, but Christ told us that he came to serve and not to be served. That our calling is not just about us, is it? I've known people who have done that. They've tried to do their calling just with themselves. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to be part of a family. And so service is an opportunity for us to get our mind off ourselves and our problems, the giants we're facing, and focus on someone else. And it's not that we ignore these things, but oftentimes it puts a perspective on it, doesn't it? You can say, my life is horrible, and then you talk to somebody and you understand, I'm not dealing with some of the things they're dealing with that are really hard. And we can help, if only to be a support and encouragement. We can give compassion in that regard. We're also admonished to do to others as we would have them do to us. We can't do that if we're not around and helping. At times we need, may need someone to help us. How many times have you gone to a friend in desperate times and you just need to vent? You just need to say things out loud. It's not that you're looking for a solution or even commiseration. You just need to say it and get it off your mind. Sometimes that's the biggest service we can give. But service is not to be done just so we can receive it back. We must serve with a sincere heart. Let's look at that in Luke 14. This is the way of the world, isn't it? To do something, to usually expect something back. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Luke 14, verse 12, Christ reminds us that we need to have a different perspective. Breaking into the thought here, he's talking about the one who was invited, the guest invited, and he had the preeminent seat. And so then, verse 12, he says, 
when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back. Now, he's not saying we don't ever do this. What he's saying is don't do it so that you get the reciprocity. But, verse 13, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you to serve others, specifically knowing they can't return the kind. He says, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. God will repay us. The purpose of service is to reflect our character before God. How does God know what we will do? if we're not doing. Acts 20 is the other verse there. This is an interesting verse because a thought is recorded here that's not in the Gospels. We shouldn't be surprised at that because at the end of John's account, he actually wrote that if everything was recorded of what Christ said and did and thought, the whole world would be filled with books. But in Acts 20, Paul makes this statement as he's talking to those at Ephesus, as he's encouraging them. And so, Acts 20, verse 35, he says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Now, how did he do that? He taught them from Scripture, absolutely, but he also did it by serving. He remained a tent maker for a long time after he was an apostle because he didn't want them to think he was doing it just for the money. So he says, I've shown you, I've set the example that you must support the weak and remember the words of Lord Jesus that said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Godly service is part of God's righteous character. He serves us all the time, every day, and he wants to see us do the same. The five stones, those smooth stones that David picked up and put in his bag were what he knew he needed to do his part. He had confidence in them, just like we can have confidence in those metaphorical stones. Having used those stones before, he knew what the outcome would be. We can have every confidence as well. The outcome will be good. <laughs> we may not know the particulars, but the outcome will be good. And as I mentioned previously, David didn't just pick up one stone. He picked up five. He needed one right then, the other four to finish the job. And as Christians, we can't just throw one stone and think our problem is solved. We need to be engaged in the whole process. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. To be reminded of the confidence again that David had, but also the confidence that we can have. Philippians 4 and verse 13, Paul says here, I can do all things, notice, through Christ who strengthens me. This goes back to the faith of Christ and being able to say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it does, because it is Christ doing the work in us. But we have to be prepared, don't we? A rich parent could give a 12-year-old a new car, but they're not equipped to drive it, are they? They don't have even the physical size to be able to do it, the mental acuity that's needed. All things through Christ. Once the stone left the sling that David released before Goliath, he'd done his part. There are all kinds of things that could have changed the outcome. A wind gust could have blown that stone slightly off and it wouldn't have killed Goliath. He could have released that stone a little early. There could have been any number of things that have happened Though even though the stone might be as aerodynamically sound as possible, it wasn't in David's control any longer, was it? It was God who took down Goliath. David said that up front. David was just the tool in God's hand, and he realized it. So let's go back. I should have asked you to hold your place to 1 Samuel 17. First Samuel 17 and in verse 45, we'll begin. We read this earlier. David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I would hope 
And whatever trials you face in the coming year, you would have the same confidence David had. We're not facing these trials on our own, by ourselves, with our own power or might. David asked God to deliver him. We can have the same confidence. And so in verse 46, he says, he will deliver you into my hand. Verse 47, that all should know. They might not change their minds. It didn't make the Philistines suddenly start worshiping the God of Israel, did it? But they certainly knew the God of Israel backed up them backed them up, I should say, Israel, that they were delivered. He will give you into our hands. As we face the coming year, let's remember what David said there in verse 37. The eternal who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this, if I can change the word slightly, giant. If we remain confident in God, he will deliver us. We gain our victory for all the trials we face through Christ living in us. Only through that, only having Christ live in us to help face our trials, will we gain the victory over them. But again, we do our part, don't we? Prayer, fasting, meditation, Bible study, and service. There's a quote along this line that I've always appreciated and came to mind as I was putting this sermon together. Some of you might recognize the name most probably wouldn't. It's General Ferdinand Fouck, F-O-C-H. He was a French general of the French, uh, during World War I, rather, considered one of, his, one of the leading generals of the time. He was in a desperate place at one point in the war, and he sent a dispatch to his superiors because they were in deep trouble. He was reporting, but I, as I started out my sermon saying, your perspective often changes how you view things. He said in his report, hard pressed on my right, my center is yielding, impossible to, uh, impossible to maneuver, situation excellent, I attack. No matter what type of trial we face, we have a formula that will help us to face those giants. Let us pick up the five smooth stones of prayer, fasting, Bible study, meditation, and service and allow God to deliver us.